again, things like hunting access or um, other impacts. Um, one of the mysterious things is that, for some reason, some animals avoid roads. Down in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, grizzly bear biologists found that where there are higher densities of roads, there's a much lower likelihood of finding grizzly bears. And these are not necessarily highly trafficked roads. They're just roads. They might be forest service or other roads. So you can actually get animals that actually refuse to cross roads. Likewise, as once the road goes in, we often treat them, right? It might be with, with salt. It might be with herbicides and pesticides along the roadside, a number of different kinds of things. And that can also have impacts that we didn't necessarily plan for across the ecosystem. Another aspect of roads, of course, is altered hydrological processes. And I'm going to talk about that more later, so I won't talk about it here. And the last is that in particular kinds of roads, part you know, particularly those, for example, on crown land, that maybe are meant to be temporary roads but then stay, they ultimately can destabilize slopes. So you can actually have landslides and things like that that um, actually can have a multitude of impacts across the ecosystem over time. All right, so let's pause here. We now know a little bit more about road ecology and some of the impacts that we have to watch for. And look at this global picture. It's not the most uplifting, I apologize for that. Um, but what strikes me about this picture is that here in North America, we're almost seeing the creeping of roads moving further and further north. You guys are blessed and don't have so many yet. This is a map of just Canada. And what you can really see here is, you know, so here are the highly, highly developed areas. These green lines, you can actually see that they're really following roads, are those what they call um, uh, resource extraction areas, right? And so what you can see is that, you know, it's where you can almost predict where the next roads will go based on this pattern. Another thing that you can predict from this is, is where species are likely to be imperiled, right? This, if you click backwards, you can see, okay, red area, highly developed, and whoops, we have a lot of imperiled species right here as well. So one of the things, there's a paper being written right now about three states of the world. And you can just sort of downscale that to Y to Y. There's sort of the area we're in, which is the really sort of still intact area. There is the area that's at risk of being fragmented. And then there's the area down in the US, for example, where those grizzly bears are disconnected, which is fragmented. It's a situation from a conservation perspective in order to achieve the Y to Y vision, we have to work on restoration. So, what can we learn as we see more development and see roads go in in the far north that we already have experienced in the south? What can we do better? So let's talk a little bit about the unintended consequences of roads. So this here is a map of um, southeastern British Columbia. And you can look at what the roads looked like in 1952 and what they looked like in 1986. And unfortunately, I don't have the next map. but one road is an access point for more roads to be built. You almost never in this world see roads get decommissioned. It just doesn't happen that often at the scale at which roads are being built. So as Yukon thinks about their roads and where they're going to go, it's really important to know that it's highly unlikely that these roads will get decommissioned. A second consequence, I mentioned that we were working with CPAWS and some other groups on finishing Banff National Park, this missing area right here. Um, and, um, you know, by the way, that used to be, a large chunk of that used to be part of uh, Banff National Park. So parks do disappear and decrease, but uh, roads tend to increase. Um, and so we're looking to kind of refinish this piece. Um, so in order to tell this story and relate it to roads, I want to talk about how roads have a multiplicative impact. They're the entry point. So 
Here in red, you can see the roads across the landscape, and I should have pointed out this area is the Bighorn area, the area between Banff and Jasper that we're looking to protect, and this will tell you the story about why. So there are the roads. The blue areas now are the cut blocks, which they get to from the roads. Next are the utility corridors, which are serviced by the roads. And next are the well sites, the drill sites across the landscape. And last are the seismic lines. This is an incredibly industrialized landscape that is serviced by what? By the roads. So you put in roads and more things come. So be prepared is my message to you all in, in Alberta and let's hope, or in Alberta, in Whitehorse, um, and let's hope that Alberta gets it right and protects this last piece, which is still relatively intact. Another unintended consequence of roads is that once continuous populations, such as of grizzly bears, become fragmented. So remember that this used to be a continuous population. You really couldn't genetically distinguish between the populations uh, back then. Dr. Michael Proctor put this paper together, and every single one of these little outlines with a number on the inside is a genetically unique population. It's unique because of why? Mainly because of roads. So let me point out right here is Highway 3 going through here. Um, and Highway 3 is a known barrier for grizzly bears. They're no longer crossing it. And it's not, remember, roads don't just come by themselves. It's the development on either side of the highway and all of the human activity associated with that road that's causing that genetic barrier. It also looks like wolverines are genetically isolated. In other words, not crossing that road either. And also, mountain goats are in the same boat. One of the other and unintended consequences is species decline. So this is from the narrowest part of the Yellowstone to, oops, or I could just speed right through it. Um, the narrowest part of the Yellowstone to Yukon region in the Peace River. These are all linear disturbances, roads, uh, uh, power lines, etc. I'm sure it comes to no surprise to you, but the, the caribou population there is declining by 10 to 50% per year depending on the populations in that landscape. So this is the kind of landscape where we have one last opportunity to get it right. Right now there's only 4% protected areas in that landscape, we can do better. And overall, mountain caribou were only found in the greater in the Yellowstone to Yukon region. We already we just this year lost caribou as a species from the United States short of uh, immaculate conception, the three females that are left in that herd are on their way to extinction. Likewise, the next herd up had 24 and now has seven individuals thought to be all the same sex. This is the story that happens with roads, so uh, be cautious. One of the last things I want to talk to you about is that um, roads can, you know, are often built in valleys because it's easy to do, right? They often follow river systems. This is in my backyard outside of Canmore. This is the Bow Valley. I live on top of 150 feet of flowing water because although we see the water in the river, actually the river is the whole entire valley and that water, in, in our case, 150 feet of it flowing underneath the town of Canmore. Um, it turns out that researchers, um, Rick Hauer and others, were able to show that that entire valley or the entire river system that you can't see because it's flowing underwater are hugely and disproportionately important for just about all wildlife. So one of the surprises when he started to ask uh, carnivore biologists and others to engage are things like the majority of carnivore kills of grizzly bear and wolf kills actually happen on that river, that gravel bed river system. And it's because there's an amazing amount of nutrients that upwell from that stream um, and really create this energy that all life depends on. And that's why it's used disproportionately. So when roads go in, it's really important to think about how they go in. It's things like this riprap 
either to support bridges going across or to keep roads from getting washed out that completely change the hydrology, uh, hydrology of systems, they could be avoided if they were well planned. You all, as roads go forward in this system, have an opportunity to get it right. One of the other considerations around how you deal with, with them, this is uh, from, again, from Canmore in 2013 during the floods. I don't know if you can see this, but this is the bridge and this was the road. Um, and with climate change happening, it's more important than ever to plan for really big open span bridges and completely transform um, you know, how we used to conservatively use sort of small culverts to much bigger ones given the different kinds of flooding that are happening today. The final unintended consequence of roads is particular to up here I wanted to mention is the introduction of fire. So you get, you know, as you get an edge effect from roads, you get drying along the region, somebody throws out a cigarette and boom, you've got um, all of a sudden that fragment of forest that's left often is um, at risk of increased fire. So what can you do about this? I'll just mention that you know, one of the important things to do is to make sure you have the right information and that you bring scientists. I see Hillary here from WCS who has been working on uh, various projects. Kate's somewhere over yonder, um, another scientist in the audience. Scientists are really important for helping us to understand really complex problems. The second thing is um, thinking about what species you care about when you're going into planning. And you'll see some examples of this from our colleagues who are talking next on sort of sm what small scale and large scale can look like. And the third is really having a clear understanding of your long-term goals. There might be a long-term goal of having, for example, a mine, but how does that road relate to human values? Maybe it's values of having this moose as, as or these, these moose um, as dinner someday, or maybe it's the value of tourism, of people who come to see these kinds of things. Um, how do you make sure that you're also conserving those values as you move to develop that road to service a mine? So I'm gonna stop there, but I hope I was able to give you a little bit of an overview of why large landscape connectivity is so important, what road ecology is, what some of the unintended consequences of roads can be, and maybe how we begin to take some steps forward. And I'm gonna hand it over to, I think, Mike and then to you. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jens Hilke. I'm a conservation biologist with Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. And you all are looking at me thinking, what is this guy doing here? Well, uh, we were in that, we're in that dark red area in some of the maps that Jody just showed. Um, but we, we do have a long history. Uh, and so I'm hoping to sort of put this discussion of, of roads and wildlife in more of a community context. So. We're coming from Vermont, and the good news about Vermont uh, is that it's on a really small scale. In terms of the, uh, as far as the U.S. federal government is concerned, we're the second most rural state in the, in the Union next to Alaska. But what that means for us is very, very different than, uh, than what you all experience here. So we're, uh, we're a, a rural, a, a residential forest is maybe a better way of saying it. There's something like 700,000 people in the state. It's a really small area. Um, and we have a really long history. Um, in the 1850s, we were about 20% forest cover. And today, we find ourselves at about 75% forest cover. So we've had this dramatic impact on our landscape. And now that landscape has been reformed forested uh, and incredible changes have happened. In some ways, it's one of the most successful ecological restorations of all time. 
But what has happened in Vermont, what the, the communities that have come back in these last 150 years are different. Uh, and so I just wanted to give you a little sense of, of sort of our history and, and maybe some of the take home messages for you all from that history. So this is uh, uh, on a way to one of our ski towns. It's called Stowe, Vermont. Um, and it's an aerial photo from 1962. And what I've done is I've colored forest cover uh, in this series of aerial photos. And so here in 62, this is still a connected landscape from my point of view, both east, west, north, south. I know this looks very different than the sort of landscape that you all experience, but this is what connectivity looks like in the, in the, in the dark red area. Um, so here we are, 1974, we put our first roads into this block that uh, was a contiguous forest. 1980, check this one out, 1996, and did you notice all those ponds popped up? Uh, those are all, uh, every, each one of the big homes has its own pond, you know, you might want to do a little swimming. Um, and then uh, 2007, and here we are in 2011. And so in that sequence, it might surprise you, there's been no net change in, in green. So we still have a lot of trees, but what's happened is because of the, the road infrastructure being built in there, we've dramatically changed the pattern of our forest. And that is in turn causing habitat loss. And so we're most concerned about forest pattern in Vermont right now, uh, uh, looking at that larger pattern at that landscape scale. The other thing that's been happening in Vermont is we've been getting some pretty big flooding. Um, in 2011, we had Hurricane Irene, and, and it really destroyed a huge portion of our municipal infrastructure. The, the federal infrastructure, the interstate highway, was largely unaffect, ineffected, unaffected, but the municipal infrastructure was hammered. And so we're, it was really that, that flooding and that economic bottom line that first got us thinking about our, the impact of, of roads and changing the way we do things. <clears throat> So um, Vermont has the, our, my Fish and Wildlife Department and our Agency of Transportation have joined the Staying Connected Initiative. And it's, uh, it's much like, the, it's the Eastern version, I'll say, uh, of Y to Y. Um, and we're also uh, you know, huge proponents of this multi-pronged approach uh, and realizing that no one partner can do it all. As good intentioned as the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department might be or our Agency of Transportation, we simply can't do it all. So I just wanna go through these different prongs of our multi-pronged approach and give you a sense of how we've embedded this into, into our community work. Um, so I'll start with some of the conservation science. Um, what Staying Connected has done is it's brought a, a real eco-regional context to our understanding of what's happening in Vermont. What you see here is, uh, this is the Vermont border. Uh, this is a huge forested area, the Adirondack uh, State Park. Um, and the colored blobs that you see are linkage areas. These are, these are valleys in between our large forest blocks that we're most concerned about from this landscape scale as being at risk. Our connections are at risk. And so Staying Connected has brought this eco-regional scale science and said, look, Vermont, Look how many of those are within your border. Look at the extent to which you have play a role in, in connecting the entire northern Appalachian ecoregion. It's the most intact, temperate, broadleaf forest uh, in the world, that whole blue area. So uh, while we're home to, it, uh, that's about 80 million acres and home to about 8 million people. But then, so we start, with, we start with this prioritization at that eco-regional level, looking at certain pinch points that connect the landscape. But then we go down a scale in our science and we look within the state boundaries. What are the places within Vermont that contribute to that eco-regional scale connections? Um, and so we've, uh, the state has introduced uh, Vermont conservation design. And that's our blueprint for what conservation success looks like moving forward. And I just want to give you a sense of this because I think working, starting your prioritization for what you care about ecologically at the landscape scale is incredibly important. 
this is work that I bring to local Vermont communities as well. Um, and so my job is to, to work with all 251 Vermont towns and bring this science to them and help them apply it. I'll talk more about that in a second, but let's just get into this for now. So it shows these highest priority areas across the state, the highest priority places for ecological function at this landscape scale. Um, the, our unit, the, the first thing that we start with, are forest blocks. So again, we're looking at that pattern. Where do we have forest? Where do we have development? Um, and these are shaded by, um, by color. Uh, darker is bigger forest blocks. And that happens to be the, the uh, spine of the Green Mountains. Uh, and this is a huge forested area. And then we have lots of people here. Uh, and this is a much more rural landscape here. So we have this pattern of our largest forest blocks sort of running north-south, uh, consistent with, with our mountains. So these, these forest blocks are the basic unit. We've got 4,052 of them in Vermont. And we've taken, we've, pr we've taken those habitat blocks and we've prioritized some for, uh, for different ecological values. So we look at interior forest, the deep, dark woods. What, what blocks of habitat are functioning for this most important, uh, for, for those sorts of ecological processes? We've done another set that uh, looks, prioritizes these forest blocks from the standpoint of physical landscape diversity. I don't know where all of the biological diversity is in Vermont. But I do know where calcium is, calcium bedrock. And for us, that calcium is a better indicator of where we're going to have biological diversity into the future. So if we can map the calcium, we can figure out where, even with climate change, even with our species changing, uh, our species compositions changing, where we're going to have that biological diversity into the future. So this is how we're embedding uh, climate resilience into our ecological planning. Yes, I'm coming back to roads, I promise, but I'm starting at this landscape scale because that's how we get to prioritizing our road sections, by thinking big, by thinking about that big pattern first and then getting into the specific, the site specific. So another input here is surface waters and riparian areas. And so we partly, um, we, we've mapped all of them and, uh, um, and then help, that helps inform and prioritize the forest blocks that are near it. This is particularly true, this is a more fragmented part of Vermont. And so the, the presence of those riparian networks is what ties our forest blocks together. You can't just look at the terrestrial system and the aquatic system separately. So then, finally, we've chosen these, these highest priority connectivity blocks, the places in Vermont that are participating in this eco-regional network. Again, it's another subset of forest blocks. So we started with that landscape scale, northern Appalachian scale, eco-regional vision. Then we got to this state, statewide pattern of where there are connectivity blocks. And from that, we, we can select individual uh, road sections, wildlife road crossings. And so this is a m model, it's a computer model, but it began with that landscape scale and now we're into the world of identifying specific road sections that connect these highest priority blocks. Now it's still just a model, we're working on, on checking it. Um, in places like this, I'd say our model is pretty off. Uh, but in places like this, yeah, I'm quite sure, uh, I'm quite sure it's good. So we have to make sure, we have to be a little careful with our science and make sure that the science we're, we're using is operating at the scale that we need it to. So um, that was the sort of that conservation science, that prioritization piece. And so some of the partners in our, in our habitat connectivity work in Vermont are actively contributing on this conservation science. So there's a whole set of partners, uh, my agency in particular, that's working on those landscape scale visions and providing that data to the people who need them. Not only the local communities, but also the, the highway departments. And so um, that's the first piece. 
Uh, I'll just show you this next piece. This is a bridge that we built, uh, the Agency of Transportation built in 2003 with a lot of input from my department. We said, you know, this is a really active bear area. Please, please, please try and oversize it so it, it's appropriate for bear to move under. In our uh, very confined landscape, we have narrow valleys. Those underpasses are critically important for us. And so we built that in 2003. And then we told our conservation partners about it, and they started working on, uh, on conserving that land. And so the green, the dark green, is permanently protected state-owned land, and the, the yellow is permanently protected privately owned land. Uh, but they're not able to develop it into the future. So the, the, the interplay between the science, the transportation and the land protection becomes all important here, is using those multiple strategies at the same time to build something bigger. Just the bridge alone doesn't get you that network, that pattern of connectivity you're looking for. It's those multiple strategies, those multiple groups of partners working together to make sure that the, the connectivity is embedded into the community. I'm gonna talk more about that. So um, another piece of our work is really actively engaging our agency of transportation. And Vermont is, is very well known for the relationship of the, the Fish and Wildlife Department and the agency of transportation. Um, and the reason for that is because, like you all, there are not a lot of people in Vermont. And so we can just call the people we know and say, hey, we, we got a road section, what do you think? Should we, well, can we oversize this bridge? What can we do? Let's drive out there. And so those interpersonal connections within the government set the stage for interpersonal connections between groups and therefore conservation success. So that's a hugely important piece in our, in our road ecology work. So anyway, we do a lot of work with our agency of transportation and um, one of the most important things we've done with our agency of transportation is moved where my department gets involved. So typically, there, the uh, transportation agency is planning 10, 20, 30, 50 years out on a very different time scale than most of us are planning. So in, our, in, in project review, we've moved where the, the transportation agency finds out about natural resources to the very beginning, before they put pen, pen to paper, before they plan anything about a bridge, they realize, they, they learn where all of the resources are. So we have an environmental section in our agency of transportation, and they work very closely with me, and we have these, uh, we give them the data sets, and there are certain triggers in the data set. If it's a three out of five, they give me a call, and then we do a site visit. So just that, that act of switching, uh, it's, a, it's a policy, it's a very boring policy statement, but it makes all the difference in the world. That timing of when we get involved allows us to, to brainstorm together without affecting the, the cost of the project. So that's a huge piece in our, in our transportation work. There's a lot more uh, that we've been doing with our agency of transportation that I'd love to tell you about. Uh, <clears throat> so the other part of my work is providing technical assistance to Vermont municipalities. So we don't have a state land use plan. We don't have any sort of federal land use planning. The way we decide where development happens is within the municipality. So Vermont's a small state, now take 251 separate towns. And if you want to affect the where development happens in Vermont, you have to reach out to all 251 of those separate entities. And that, my friends, is my job. So. 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, weeknights. <laughs> we have planning commission meetings, conservation commission meetings, and there I am with lots of coffee, and I get out my pom-poms and I say, hey, this is why your place is so awesome. This is an amazing spot. You've got these incredible wildlife species. Look at this eco-regional vision of all of this connectivity across the region. You've got a range of options. Let's talk about what we might be able to do with it. So that technical assistance is really important because it's embedding, it's explaining this eco-regional vision, this prioritization of all the science, 
It's translating that and bringing it to the communities. So that's a huge piece of this road ecology work is getting past the science jargon and getting it into a language, into a format that people can understand and deal with. We're planning for whole communities. So I'm not up there just saying, well, you got to do this for the bears. No, we're doing this for our, our own community values. Um, and so there's a, there's a whole balancing act with all of these different values that we're trying, that are trying to play out on the landscape at the same place. So for us, in a much more space confined place, we're looking to meet multiple values at the same time. We're looking to find where we can recreate and have wildlife habitat and have a working forest. Those multiple values are really important to having anything survive. Um, <coughs> another huge part of this community outreach effort is, is helping people to understand their communities. So this is the built environment. Oops. This is the built environment up top, the infrastructure. But that's only a fraction of what the whole community is about. This is all of those social skills. And in some of the poorer communities, they may have a lot of time, they may have a lot of people, but not a lot of money. That's a tremendous resource for a community. And it's really important that they know that uh, and that they, in, in problem solving, they can use that. So we're embedding this discussion of roads and wildlife into, this, into the fabric of the community so that they can understand uh, what their role is in it. <coughs> so a lot of the work we do is in, uh, is in um, training these groups. And so we have a training, we call it NR2, uh, in basically how to do this, uh, this translation, how to build a team, how to, how to make sure that team has an, a, 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 a real representation of the community, and then how to take a, a natural resource issue like road ecology and bring it into the municipal planning process. So training our local citizens is a hugely important part uh, of how we're approaching connectivity work. Um, this is a, another uh, community planning toolkit that I found uh, for First Nations uh, in Ontario, and it um, maps out, you know, this this system of well, where have we been? Where are we? Uh, where are we? Where are we now? Where do we want to go? How do we get there? Um, and so this community planning framework, and so we can embed these natural resource these natural resource discussions in this larger sense of community values. For us in Vermont, that comes down to the town plan. Um, the municipal plan is where we, where we have the balancing act between private property rights and the rights of the commons. And we're making sure that, uh, that the discussion of, of wildlife isn't just in the natural resources section, but is also embedded in the transportation section and the energy section and the land use section. So, so uh, again, so that this discussion of, of roads uh, makes, uh, is, is planned for in all of these different contexts. One of the tools I use a lot in working with communities is called community value mapping. And we get as many people as we possibly can from a town into a room together. And we break them up randomly into small groups and there's a base map in the middle of each small group. And there's a facilitator for each small group and we say, what do you love about this town? And they draw sections of it. And they'll say, okay, well, I love the, the fishing and the water quality here on Lewis Creek. And you know, when I drive over this, uh, this hill, I get this sweeping vista of farmlands and mountains in the back, and I really love that. And down here in the valley, I hear the spring peepers. And here in Hinesburg Town Forest, I go, uh, I do my hunting and ATVing and cross-country skiing. And so it's this very, uh, it's a really comprehensive look at what it means to live live in this town. But then we can overlap those with what I would consider ecological priorities. And so it's a, there, it's a map of potential allies, really, in moving conservation forward. And so you know uh, this is a, a separate town, but the same process, community wildlife map, uh, community value mapping. Um, 
and you can see the different values here and then some of the ecological resources here. But uh, again, it, it, it's, this, uh, it's this map of potential allies, potential um, of, of real consensus across the landscape. Um, and so this can be an incredibly important starting point for moving conservation forward because again, it's not just for the bears, but it's for the fabric of the community. As we look towards conservation, connectivity conservation into the future, it's a huge message for us is that there are a lot of different ways of moving forward. And it's the municipalities in our context, it's the municipalities that make those decisions. What is connectivity conservation going to look like in that place? So we in Staying Connected and me in the, for the state bring this eco-regional vision. We bring the science. We bring the interpretation of the science. But it's the local communities that decide what it's going to look like. Are you going to use a regulatory tool or a non-regulatory tool? Are you going to just try and get the word out with a lot of education and outreach? Or are you going to write it in the town plan? Or are you going to do some zoning? What's connectivity, go connectivity conservation going to look like? So that range of options message is really empowering because it says you decide what connectivity conservation looks like. At the end of the day, we're making sure that our work in these communities is in, it, it involves this message of healthy economy, healthy ecology, healthy community. And you don't get that healthy ecology without a healthy economy and vice versa. And so we can connect the two and say, no, again, we're not just doing this for the bears, though I think that's terribly important. We're doing this because, of the, 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 because the community wants it and it overlaps with those community values. So a lot of our road ecology work is embedded in our outreach, uh, in our land use planning and our outreach work. And so we have a separate set of partners uh, that do this municipal technical assistance and this outreach as a way of us advancing habitat connectivity. Oh, that was a, a whirlwind tour from the other side of the continent, um, but thank you all so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm Rob Ament. I'm the Road Ecology Program Manager at the Western Transportation Institute. Uh, we're based at Montana State University, uh, but we actually have staff in Canada uh, and staff on the U.S. side. Uh, we have been looking and studying the effects of roads on wildlife uh, and on aquatic species, on native plant communities, et cetera. Uh, for about since uh, the 90s and uh, we've been looking especially uh, we're well known for our wildlife research uh, Dr. Tony Clevenger who Jody mentioned has been uh, studying the Banff crossings the largest and the very first uh, uh, mitigation for wildlife at the landscape level uh, for 20 years and then the Confederated Salish Kootenai Tribes, 41 crossings. Uh, a colleague of ours, Dr. Marcel Hauser, has studied that for uh, about 14 years. So these are the world's two biggest projects. And so we had a, a lot to learn. And I'm going to share some of the results and uh, some other findings about what you do if you do have a road and you do want to take care of your wildlife values as well. And uh, I don't mean this in a, any cosmic sense, but uh, what I really mean is uh, the world is building roads like crazy. Like uh, we have uh, so many roads here that uh, you could drive to the moon so many times and back as the numbers show there. But uh, this is a problem that isn't just uh, 
uh, North America, but it's really a, a global issue. And uh, this particular slide, this was just uh, published this year, uh, shows how many uh, roads have been built since the turn of the century, and then how many are projected. And uh, what a lot of it uh, is, is the undeveloped areas are where 90% uh, of the projected 25 million new roads are going to be going into a lot of landscapes that don't have very many roads or no roads at all. So what we're really seeing is that, that road footprint rapidly expanding uh, all across the world. Uh, and so we have a lot to learn and a lot to share with one another uh, as we uh, learn more and more about what works and what doesn't work for mitigating roads. And uh, this just uh, proves the point that uh, uh, as we have a huger human footprint, uh, the ability of wildlife to be able to move is severely impacted and roads are one of the greatest barriers to wildlife movement. And the other thing is uh, with the global warming issue, uh, one of the, oh, sorry about that, uh, one of the top strategies among conservation biologists to allow wildlife to adapt is to maintain that connectivity. So a lot of these key pinch points to movement are caused by our, our transport systems. And so we really do have to make sure that uh, they're passable for wildlife. And uh, Jody did cover uh, uh, these issues about uh, some of the implications of roads. And I'll be covering a lot about the direct mortality and how you mitigate it and talk a lot about the barrier effect to wildlife uh, from roads too, that some of the findings we've uh, uh, gathered uh, over the years. And um, one of the things is sometimes we drive down roads and we say, well, we don't see any dead animals, so uh, we clearly don't have a problem. And as you can see, this is four years of collar data that, uh, as we learned about wildlife movement on uh, Interstate 15 uh, we could see the four years of pronghorn collar data, they never crossed once in four years. And uh, the elk data, the only one individual crossed in four years. And when we discuss this road with both the Idaho and the Montana Departments of Transportation, they said we don't need to mitigate this road because there's no wildlife vehicle collisions, so there's no problem. So um, these are the kinds of things that we're learning by uh, putting GPS and other collars on animals. This was just recently discovered uh, in Wyoming uh, w when they started uh, collaring a lot of their ungulates there too. This is called the Wyoming uh, Great Migrations uh, Initiative. And again, every single species stops at the interstate highway. So it's become a total barrier for all wildlife movement or all herd movement. And so uh, this road hasn't been uh, mitigated. And so what we're starting to see, this same road uh, going across Nevada. Nevada, just two years ago, built the very first interstate crossing uh, to get their mule, mule deer herds across the road. And this is now projected to be built in the next year or two in Utah. So uh, don't do what we did, which was we built our road systems uh, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s before we considered the needs of wildlife. And now we're doing what's much more expensive, which is to go back in and retrofit and try to make them passable again for wildlife. Uh, and then the other thing, talking about roads, I know you don't have any four-lane four highways in, in the Yukon, so I wanted something more practical, what we're learning on these more rural two-lane highways. Uh, this was a study outside of uh, Glacier National Park in Montana, and and as you can see, uh, I keep hitting the wrong button here, so excuse me, but uh, they actually put the uh, pneumatic air tubes to count traffic by the hour to try to get a sense of when bears uh, cross the road and when they don't and what the traffic volumes were. And they had collared bears on both sides of the road. And what they found was um, 100, mi 100 vehicles per hour uh, never after the traffic hit that level, that hourly rate, did a collared bear ever cross the road. So it actually is a barrier, but it's not a complete barrier right now. This is what you would call a partial barrier. 
And so now the, the, the grizzlies can only cross at night for about 10 p.m. till you know, seven or eight in the morning. Uh, and uh, this could be similar to like Kluwani where this is a highway that gets its heaviest use in the summer when the tourists are here in, in that part of the uh, area, uh, that part of Montana and uh, when the grizzlies are out. And so uh, they're very concerned about this road and, and, and wildlife movement. Uh, and this is a, a, a study that's in progress, but they knew I was coming up here and it's relevant because this is now ungulates and this is a very rural two-lane highway in Wyoming. And the same issue uh, occurs, or they're finding on this too, where it's not uh, the annual, the, the daily traffic on average, but it's the hourly traffic. It's the gaps between cars that are actually respond, the animals are responding to. And this is based on, uh, they had uh, cameras set up, video cameras that would be tripped when the deer approached the road. And then they would film them in infrared. And they have 1,700 individual animals that they're picking through the tapes to see whether they cross the road or didn't cross the road, or if they cross the road, they got hit. Uh, and so they either had successful crossings or unsuccessful crossings. And they're getting the, the same kind of information uh, that um, uh, it depends on uh, how many, how big of a gap there is between vehicles, which can be related to uh, the uh, traffic rate or vehicles per hour. So the same story is happening. Uh, with ungulates and with grizzlies. And these are the very first two studies and they've just come out in the last couple years. So we're just starting to learn, not just about sort of gross animal, uh, we're learning about animal behavior around the roads and around traffic. And this is all s relatively new information that will help us uh, consider what we need to do. These researchers are able to now take that across the state using traffic data across the state and actually select priority areas based on this new information. So a lot of what Jens was talking about in Vermont, where do you set priorities statewide, they're using this kind of information in Wyoming. And so basically when you have uh, wildlife issues, uh, you have basically three types of uh, strategies. One is to change animal behavior, uh, and that's like uh, you've heard of deer whistles that they put on the bumpers of vehicles or uh, roadside reflectors or even these boulder fields. Uh, you'll notice that if an errant car would go into a boulder, boulder field, it'd be a safety issue, so they put them behind guardrails. But that's for ungulates and clearly not in a snowy uh, environment because that in the winter then that wouldn't work but uh, they're, they're, they've been testing those too as ways to keep ungulates meaning deer elk and moose and and pronghorn off the road and then you try to change driver behavior and I'll give you a couple examples of that and then finally the separation what we've saw in Banff and and uh, on the uh, Salish Kootenai reservation which is separate the animals from the drivers with fences and then provide crossing structures. So for cha changing uh, animal behavior, I'll just give you one example. Uh, and this is a, a Wyoming study where they use, I won't name the commercial uh, provider of this, but they make a claim that you can get 90% reductions just by putting up reflector lights down the highway. And the principle is your headlight hits that reflector and it, it then goes into the deer's eye that's in along, the, along the side of the road and they freeze in the, when the lights hit them in the eye. And then when the car passes, the lights go off and the animal moves again. And uh, so they, they actually did a, a really rigorous study, study of that. And uh, they found out that actually it's only about 32% reductions. And the amazing side story of all this is when they covered the reflectors up, they actually doubled the, re the effectiveness. So um, they actually want to now have a study about white bags on the side of the roads and <laughs> what's going on there. Again, trying to understand wildlife behavior is quite difficult. So uh, that would be trying to change animal behavior. It's very difficult. 
Uh, the other thing is trying to change driver behavior, and of course, we all know this is risky, so no drivers ever pull out their cell phone when they're driving, right? Uh, so uh, the other way we try to change this driver behavior is say, be careful, there's animals out there, and uh, we put warning signs up. Again, not very effective measures at all. And then uh, they also said, well, what if we just slow drivers down? And so uh, this is that project uh, that's in progress in Wyoming on a, a rural two-lane highway. And uh, what they found, I keep hitting the wrong button, I apologize, uh, that they reduced it about uh, 15 miles per hour and uh, put the signs up and then they put speed guns and they hid in, hid in the sagebrush and basically recorded uh, human behavior uh, when they hit the zone. And they found that basically it didn't uh, do anything to just simply put up a uh, reduction in speeds. And what traffic engineers will tell you is that uh, people drive as fast as the highway is designed for, uh, not what the signs tell you you're supposed to drive. So if you feel s safer driving faster, you will drive faster than what's posted. And so an improvement on just signage uh, to get people to slow down and then be more alert is the notion of having animal detection systems that only turn flashing lights on when animals are approaching the road or crossing the road. And so they've tried many different systems. My colleague at uh, WTI has studied over 12 different uh, commercial systems from around the world on these break the beam or, or radar, radar or radio or microwave beams. And um, what they found, this was out of the Yellowstone, a, a two-lane rural highway th going through Yellowstone National Park. It's basically the same story that uh, uh, before they uh, are, no lights are flashing, they go about uh, a little under 60 miles an hour. And I'll be, it, it should be noted the speed limit's 55. Uh, and then when the lights are flashing, you only get about a two or three mile, uh, both uh, in the day and, and, and at night. So basically, even when you try technology to try to change the driver behavior, uh, we're not seeing very much improvements. Uh, and so this is now the next generation of how they're trying to improve driver behavior to s slow down and, and uh, control uh, the, the uh, collisions with wildlife. And what it is is they fence to just a very narrow section of highway. So there's fence leading the animals and the animals can only cross right there. And they painted the road thinking wildlife would think that's a cattle grate and they wouldn't uh, come down into you know, inside the fence part of the road and get hit. And one is there's a study now on the striping of a highway and wildlife basically ignore it. Uh, and then they only turn these lights on uh, during the migrations. So these lights would only be on, not when they detected an animal, but uh, for a month in the fall and a month in the spring. And as you can see, uh, that only got about a 40% reduction using that. But in Arizona, uh, they used a um, animal detection system uh, on a gap just like that. And so this time, the lights would only turn on when an animal went through that very narrow gap. And it was amazing that th that, because of the, the lights were very reliable, they basically were only on for that, uh, for a three minute period when they detected an animal moving across there, uh, they got a 97% uh, reduction. And the way they kept the animals on the, uh, from coming down the road is they use this electromat. And so they bury the electromat on both sides of the crosswalk. And so they couldn't get down the, uh, on the inside of the fence. And so this is a very promising new, new technology that uh, uh, other states are now picking up on. And I don't, uh, I don't think they've tried one in any of the provinces yet. And of course, this is the, the last one I'll give you as an example is we're hoping that the technologies onboard vehicles are gonna help uh, uh, drivers react to, vehicle, uh, 
to wildlife on the road. And these are existing commercial systems. I don't know if anyone has a Mercedes Series S, but you have it on your car, I believe. So you, maybe you could uh, do a testimonial after, during the question period. But uh, basically, it just uh, helps detect those animals in the dark of night. And hopefully, uh, then you would be able to avoid them. And then lastly, now we're hearing about aut self-autonomous vehicles. So they have to be able to detect pedestrians, bicyclists, and they're going to be able to, uh, they're definitely developing the artificial intelligence or, or softwares that will uh, help pick up large animals. The issue with all of these uh, large animal focuses is that it doesn't protect any of the, the small animals. It's only going to pick up the, the ones that are a safety issue to motorists. And so the last uh, strategy is separate the animals from the motorists. And this was from our national study that we published in, in a journal article as well. Uh, but you could see that uh, these are all the things that we're trying to change animal behavior or try to change driver behavior. And uh, what we found was it was always uh, all the papers we could find on it or even uh, gray, lit gray literature was that it was 50% or less, so they weren't very effective. However, when you got into using the fences and in in this uh, animal detection systems promising, and all of them have fence, and then they, that means the animals can't get onto the roadway. And then to maintain the connectivity, you have to basically provide crossings for them. And that's infrastructure. That's the underpasses or the overpasses. Or the animal detection systems are at grade for the, uh, the two-lane highways. And so that's why a lot of the focus uh, in North America has been on these overpasses and underpasses. They're basically being built uh, by almost every state and, and every province in the west, western North America. And they're being implemented all over the world as well. And the nice thing is you can also build crossings for the smaller animals. And uh, it's really uh, relatively inexpensive to, to do this. And some of these are for badgers and salamanders. And then for small mammals, most highways have culverts that are passing water anyhow. And so what you do is you put shelving in there. And small mammals will use this shelving. This was uh, developed by a professor at the University of Montana. And uh, Roscoe Steel now provides these to transportation agencies everywhere to uh, provide that uh, dry, dry spaces for for small animals. And this is an example of a successful uh, set of small crossings uh, for large-toed salamanders in Waterton National Park. What was happening was on the um, entrance road during the salamander migrations out of the pools into their breeding grounds, they en masse would cross that entrance road. And it was actually the visitors who were squishing them, basically running them over and uh, you know, uh, taking uh, nearly half of the population out in some years and complained. And so then they developed these four or five, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four of these crossings. And now they're down to just, you know, uh, very, uh, even though the populations fluctuate every year, the percent of that population, now that they have these little systems in, smaller systems in, has reduced the kill. And then they have little, little fences about that high that guide the animals to, to the crossings. And the other thing they learned on, on, again, we're just learning so much new things, is when they did solid pipes, they weren't getting much use. But when now they have a grate that allows light in there as well. And as soon as that was put in, the salamanders have been using it in mass. So we have so many species we just don't quite know everything about yet. but. Innovatives, innovations occurring all over with different people trying different things. And so the other th big, the biggest thing that uh, the whole world actually, road ecologists all over the world, it's BAMP. That's sort of like go to Canada. You got to check that out. That's the best system. And uh, it's uh, so, Tony has published so many papers on it. 
And uh, so you can see that there were over uh, 44 crossings built, uh, and they were of all different types. So uh, it was quite of an investment if you're going to twin a highway through your national park. Uh, they had to maintain park integrity. And no one knew back in the 80s when these were built if, if they were going to work. Uh, but they, d they did find that uh, the animal, the, 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 what they had was cameras on every crossing, uh, that when there was animal movement, it would click. So that's how they were counting wildlife crossings. And then they had track beds in the early years. And uh, they found that the, the, the numbers of crossings recorded across uh, all of the different infrastructure was relative to the population of the animal in the park. So uh, of ungulates, deer, uh, deer were the most numerous, had the biggest population. They also had the biggest uh, recorded crossings. So that was quite comforting to know that uh, all the large mammals were basically using it in proportion to their relative population size. But they did find, and this was where the uh, they compared the overpass to the nearest underpass. And so they only had, at, uh, w this study was done when there were only two overpasses and they looked at the two underpasses next to them. And they found that there was actually preferential use depending on the species where the moose and the grizzlies love the overpass. And many of the uh, miso carniv uh, carnivores like cougars and coyotes and fox and black bear were quite comfortable using either of them, the overpasses or the underpasses. The other big thing that when they built them at first, they said, oh my gosh, if we just fence to just the crossings, all the carnivores are just going to wait and camp out, right? And then here come all the deer and the, the elk and, and the moose. But um, uh, they published a couple papers on this and to debunk what they call the prey, prey trap hypotheses. And uh, I think in the first 17 years, the only camera trap picked up one cougar, killed a deer in an underpass, and that was it for the whole time. So they basically just, uh, th th this great concern, and you hear this all around the w world, like tigers in Asia or, you know, whatever your biggest predator is, that they're always going to wait at these crossings. And so uh, these papers have been quite useful coming out of Banff. And then the whole other uh, notion of uh, the animals feeling comfortable using these new structures uh, was demonstrated by Tony as well. And so these are a couple of the moose and the grizzly bear. And you look at the original years after, after they built the structure and closed the fencing to the structure. Uh, most PhDs are three years, right? So if they would have put a PhD candidate on that, the story would have been uh, these aren't very successful at all. But Tony was able to stick it out for decades, so uh, we even have longer graphs than these now. And uh, what, what basically has happened is they've come up here and now they bounce around, uh, but they've sort of uh, flattened out. So it is something that uh, p parents will teach their young when they go through with it. And the noise, we have camera footage of the noise a big truck would rumble and they'd back out and things like that and then they get used to it. And so these are all the different uh, types of structures. Uh, it wasn't just one type but uh, these five different ones they could compare. And uh, this was the latest paper the, uh, that was published uh, last year about uh, the, the uh, findings from genetic studies and uh, what they found was not only did the, the use increase over the 17 years, but that the sows and the cubs would only use, just basically would only use the overpasses. So uh, they were not about to go into tight quarters underneath a highway, and they liked the big open. And uh, uh, I actually put a quote from Tony up here, what he told me. And, after 20 years in Banff, he said this is the most important finding he ever had, and that was if they wouldn't have put those overpasses in and would have went with what are relatively, so it's about a million dollars for an underpass, and the overpasses cost between four and six million. And so if you would have wanted to save money and just went with underpasses, they would have had discontinuity because uh, the families weren't, wouldn't use the crossings at all, the, the underpasses. So by putting in the overpasses, they basically made uh, 
genetic uh, continuity on to both sides of the road. And then the other much cheaper thing to do, of course, when it comes to crossing, is take your existing bridges, take your existing culverts, and, and build fencing that guides the animals to them. And uh, this is a project uh, at Crow's Nest Pass on Highway 3 in, in Alberta. And so 5% uh, of the bighorn sheep were being killed every year on Highway 3 at, at Crow's Nest Pass. And so what they did was they uh, basically, Alberta Transportation has now uh, fenced two existing uh, bridges uh, that uh, uh, allow the bighorn sheep and the, the wa there's water but there's also terrestrial habitat as well so they can safely move onto the bridges to reduce this roadkill problem but the other good story about this was that this was a partnership uh, that it wasn't just the transportation department doing it but the conservation groups got involved and um, Volker Stebbins the contractor that does the uh, road maintenance uh, contributed all the fence and so it was like a community effort to uh, deal with a, a easily, uh, it had, it's a problem that had very sharp edges, like a, just two to three kilometers of the highway needed fencing. And they had a couple underpasses basically, which were bridges uh, in place. So it didn't cost a lot of money, but everyone uh, threw together to make it happen. And now uh, Yoho is going crazy. This is like the biggest overpass ever built. It's clearing six, uh, six uh, lanes of traffic. But they are being creative. This is uh, actually very innovative, uh, very uh, innovative uh, way to build these. They actually truck in each one of these ribs and then use scaffolding and then cast the keystone. So the keystone of an arch is actually cast in place once they get all the ribs put. And, and then they remove the scaffolding afterwards. And this is now complete and open to, uh, and open and, and open for business for wildlife crossing on top of it. Uh, but I guess my point here is that if you have issues in the Yukon with the roads in Kluani, uh, that you won't ever have this kind of expense uh, for, for ad addressing issues. And maybe you could work with Parks Canada uh, could easily come up with some solutions for just two-lane highways that are much simpler, less expensive. But some of the parks in Western Canada, because they have the Trans-Canadian Highway, have to come up with expensive solutions to maintain the integrity of their parks when it comes to transportation. And then lastly, I just wanted to put in that uh, there's, an, uh, there's all the ecological arguments and then uh, uh, we published a paper that looked at the, if you look at just the, the dollars and cents of it all, uh, and looked at the economic consequences. And so uh, basically we came up with, and this was for in Canadian dollars, uh, we did it for both Canada and the US. And the average uh, crash for a deer is about 6,600 back in 07. Uh, 17,000 for a larger elk and of course the bigger the animal the more damage it causes to vehicle and the more likely it's to injure humans and so we only looked at four uh, components of of that in the cost so it was just injury the value the hunting value of the animal uh, the uh, cost to the vehicle to repair and then the occasional fatalities and there aren't many wildlife vehicle collisions that end up with uh, fatalities, just uh, a few. Uh, and then I brought it forward to uh, today, or 2017, a decade forward, and you can see what the costs are. So if you're having a lot of collisions uh, and you're doing nothing, you're really, it really is costing uh, motorists a lot of money to not do anything because this is what's accruing every time you get it, accidents occur. So actually spending what seems like uh, expensive mitigation actually uh, can save you money in the long run if your crash, if your wildlife vehicle collision rates are high enough. And I won't get into, uh, uh, we, I've, we've run this on actual highway projects in Alberta and it all pencils out and, and can pay for itself. Sometimes as the one we did on 
uh, a three kilometer, one underpass with three kilometers of fencing uh, in Alberta outside the park system, uh, it paid for itself in 10 years. So basically, it was saving 100,000 a year in the cost of wildlife vehicle collisions, even though it cost, you know, $3 million to build or something like, I don't have all the numbers in front of me. The point just being that sometimes we look at just the ecological arguments and once we came up with an economic thing, a lot of the transportation engineers are starting to look at the economic values as well, uh, which helps uh, justify, if that's the right term, uh, mitigate what c some people consider expensive mitigation and that it actually will pay for itself over time. So. So uh, that's what I just wanted to wrap up with there. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, what we're going to do now is open it up for questions. Um, so I'll have our guests uh, sit up here. Um, and um, Julia will be uh, with the microphone to pass out. So, um, oh. <laughs> so if there is any of those burning questions that you have, we'll be looking for um, people to, to ask them. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, that these folks are up here for uh, three days. Uh, we met today with some Yukon government staff. Tomorrow um, we're meeting with some ENGOs and we're going to have some time with uh, a few ministers to talk to them about this. And then on Thursday, we're meeting um, with uh, First Nations to talk about these. So um, these folks are doing an incredible job helping us understand this uh, very complicated uh, circumstance. So questions? About an hour before the talk, I said, oh my goodness, I uh, don't know a lot about it in the Yukon. So I asked Dr. I asked Dr. Google, and uh, we have 3,757 kilometers of named highways in the Yukon. And so I asked Dr. Google um, uh, how many taxpayers there were in the Yukon, there were 20,000 sorry, 27,000 people filed income taxes. So each of us owns about 130 km, um, meters of uh, road in the Yukon. So just to put some figures into the, into the talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm just, I have a lot of questions, most of which I can ask tomorrow. <laughs> Um, moving backwards in the presentation, that last slide you showed, the costs, I know you said you didn't have the numbers right in front of you, but I'm curious whether that those costs were primarily to the motorists and maybe insurance companies, or did that factor in conservation officer response time and other government services that pile up when collisions happen? Yeah, w what we did was where we could get national data and tried to keep it this was our first time out, so we kept it very simple. We worked with an economist on this as well. It wasn't just a bunch of ecologists c uh, playing with numbers, but uh, uh, um, a, a lot of the things we didn't do, like for example, if you got injured and couldn't work, uh, all those indirect costs are not included in this. Uh, if it, uh, when it comes to uh, threatened and endangered species or uh, where you have program set up to try to save the species and then they're getting killed on the road. We didn't include this. There were so many things that we didn't include that we felt this, even with the most conservative costs, uh, just four things, it was penciling out on many road segments around North America that it was uh, a, a reasonable investment of public, uh, limited public dollars. Uh, so I, I hope I answered your question and that conservation values were not put into this economic look uh, in the original study. And we are about to get a grant to now update this whole thing and we're going to do a much more complicated uh, um, 
cost-benefit analysis to include many of these other values. That does answer my question. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm often on, on the road, I'm driving often, and I see lots of trucking. <clears throat> so my, what I notice on the big trucks, they have a huge fans. You can gather maybe three moose in there. But what, what I'm saying, how do we know if a trucker decides to stop and report? It's always a question, I say, well, those guys they have time, they have interest, they care, they don't care. So it's all do is kind, I'm looking, you see. Often you see animals, but you don't know. Well, if it's a car, well, it's not there, but it could be. So many trucks I see, they have, you look in the back and they have five plates and they they come from far, far away. So it can be, well, we don't have many segment of road. So it's part of the, the equation of how you calculate who is from where and Anyway, thank you. Um, yeah, well, I think a couple of points from, from what you said. One is that trucks have a lot harder time slowing down. So we were just talking, yeah, you know, there are a number of examples of, of trucks taking out not one animal, but six or seven or eight animals all in one time. Um, you know, as to whether they reported it or not, unclear. Um, whether they do report it or whether they don't report it. I think th what, what's more important is that people who, you know, oftentimes, most often actually, when an animal gets hit, it runs off the road and dies off the road. And so we know that when we're counting the number of dead animals along the road, that it's a serious undercount no matter what. Um, and I think, you know, th that's that's just the reality of where we're at. There are some studies in really focal areas where we'll have people walking transects off the road to find that roadkill, but that's pretty rare. And I'll respond on two components of it. One is semi, the big trucks, uh, it's not a safety issue with them. They can just mow through and uh, so there's not the incentive to slow down like there is for you and me in, a, in an automobile. Uh, and so, uh, outside of Yellowstone, semis plow through bison and don't slow down because it doesn't dent their vehicle or anything. So uh, we've seen five bison get mowed down by a, a semi truck. Another, uh, uh, you know, these are individual stories, but uh, one trucker killed 22 bighorn sheep, one truck. And they interviewed him, I saw it in the paper, and he said, well, I wasn't concerned for my safety. Uh, and it's not illegal, so, uh, that, you know, that's just what it is, it's not illegal. Uh, so uh, that's one, one concern. The other is uh, data uh, and, and this under-reporting of data. And there was a recent study that came out, it's Virginia, but nonetheless, they looked at the, the law enforcement records, so, when your highway patrol, I don't, uh, RCMP, I guess it would be, records a collision, they have to say what was the cause of the collision, and that's when they'll record whether it's wildlife or not. Well, some researchers went in and then actually collected data and compared it to their state highway patrol, and the highway patrol were under, the underreporting was six times less than what was really happening on the roads. So, uh, so the, the data is a big issue because if you don't have numbers to show that's a problem, then like I say on, on that one highway where there were no collisions, uh, if it becomes a barrier, it's not a problem either. So there's two, two things. One is the animals getting killed on the road and the second one is if they're not even trying to cross the road. Uh, and we need to get good data on both of those to help uh, support the, the mitigation of our roads. Okay, wow, we suddenly have a lot of questions. Um, if you've already asked a question, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to go to someone else. So let's take someone from this side of the room. Um. Um, considering insurance companies, they're big companies, right? 
And uh, we all hear about the lobbying effects in the states. I don't think Canada's quite as much. But with the with the losses that the insurance companies are seeing, are they putting any any effort or any help into uh, lobbying government to put uh, or transportation to put uh, animal crossings or some kind of mitigation in place? Uh, uh, in Canada, some of the provinces do their self-insurance, is that correct? Like British Columbia has sort of a provincial insurance pool. I, I, I don't know how to describe it perfectly. In, in the U.S., it's all just private. Uh, and I think in some provinces, I don't know what it is here in the territory. Is it just private providers, right? In British Columbia, where it's sort of the, the government's in charge, they actually... Uh, have uh, are, are using their information and, and and trying to deal with problem areas uh, in the US where it's all privatized they just change the rates so uh, uh, some of the states that have the worst problems have no mitigation at all I think what's happening and that tends to be in the east uh, uh, east where white white-tailed deer are uh, have high high populations right now um, so it's like Pennsylvania and Minnesota, the, 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 those are the states with the highest, uh, according to state farm insurance, highest rates of, of collisions with uh, wildlife. Out west, because I think, like here, uh, we uh, have our conservation values, and so I think our, 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 our transportation agencies, I want to frame this appropriately, uh, feel like they can do this because they get public backing. And so some states are really moving forward. Uh, Alberta's moving forward. They're doing their first uh, southwest. Alberta's doing a complete study of the whole area to figure out where their corridors are, where their crashes with wildlife are, and then coming up with a priority to, to mitigate those hot spots. And so it depends. It's, it's, it depends almost on every province and every state is acting independent of each other, but there are some real progressive provinces and states out there. Okay, I think, uh, Mike, do you think we have time for like one or two more? Okay. Hi there. Um, my question, I guess, is kind of in relation to um, mitigating road maintenance especially here in the Yukon in the wintertime, seems to be a sort of higher uh, roadkill rate. And I'm just wondering if uh, there's been recommendations for mitigating that, including even plowing. Um, I know in certain areas, like along Highway 16, with maybe higher snowfalls down BC, you know, it was often difficult for, you know, most say to get off the road because, you know, banks are too high. So I'm wondering, um, you know, one, in regards to salt and if there's other um, other things that are being used here on the roadways maybe to keep you know wildlife from coming on the roads in the first place but also just recommendations to to um, maintenance companies start. you know um, I was in Jackson and I want to say it was last winter but I've sort of lost track of time and they had a huge amount of snow um, and they were actually seeing animals starve to get to death, but also animals were getting trapped on the road because they literally couldn't climb the snow banks out of the road. And in those kind of situations, the only thing that can happen is self-policing of community. And so the community sort of was self-shaming other people in the community um, and putting out like handmade signs, getting people to slow down because they, they knew that those wildlife were trapped. Um, so that's uh, I, the only situation that I can think of in, in that particular circumstance. I understand here, actually, salt isn't a major component of what's used here because it's so cold. It's mostly uh, sand. And so um, that's probably not a major attractant for wildlife, but they do often look for easy places to walk. Um, and so that's just, a, that's just a basic conflict issue. Um, and I think given that this is not a high tourist industry in the winter as much as it is in the summer, I think you do, you do have an opportunity, if it's a community value, to actually sort of change uh, the way that people are driving from summer to winter, and that's, that's the only thing that I can come up with. Hi. 
Um, uh, Jody, in the beginning of your talk, you said uh, that not many roads are decommissioned once they've been built. Um, <clears throat> I'm just trying to latch on to that not many. Can you think of any, or can anybody think of any jurisdictions that are really good at decommissioning like resource roads or anything like that? So there, there certainly are examples. Um, in fact, uh, why to why with, uh, I think it's something like 60 partners in the, the British Columbia, Montana transboundary area, we worked on closing roads. And what I would say about that in that ex particular experience is one, we did we worked on a number of regrading experiences, like actually trying to fix the road and recontour the road. It is expensive. It is really, really hard to restore a road to normal. Um, also, we put in barriers, like plunked in huge rocks. Uh, people came with their private uh, tractors and we watched them remove the rocks on camera um, and they built roads and cut down trees to get around those barriers. It's very, very hard to decommission roads. Elsewhere in Alberta, they've been doing some work um, restoring some of the, the network of roads um, uh, in sort of the Kakwa area. And again, you know, in some places they're having some success, very expensive, in other places uh, you know, that restoration work might take hundreds of years to do. So um, it really, you know, I think, I think it's, it's, it's not that you can't do it, it's just it, it ought, there isn't often an impetus because often once a road gets built, there are multiple users who want to use it forever. And two, to actually remove the road and get it ecologically functional again is hard to do. so we're a few minutes into there. I just wanted to say again to these fine folk, thank you very much for bringing your skills and knowledge to us. So on behalf of the Yukon Conservation Society, thank you for sharing your time. If you aren't a member, please buy a membership on your way out, and we look forward to uh, connecting with you in the future. And this is a topic that we're certainly going to be interested in following along as an organization. Have a great evening and thanks for coming out everyone.